Okay, this is your lecture for the lung and thoracic assessment. So just a quick review, we're going to cover some things about the anatomy of the thorax. Major landmarks, of course, is your sternum, your clavicle or your collarbone, the nipple line, your suprasternal notch, which we've located that before. Angle of Louis is where you kind of come up um, at an angle here. And your costal angle is down here. These are things that you need to keep in mind as you're doing your inspection. I mean, inspection and your entire assessment. Now, the assessment, the order of your assessment for the chest and thorax, inspection, palpation, percussion, and auscultation. Again, with your anatomy, being familiar so that when you're doing your assessment, uh, when you're palpating, percussing, auscultating, that you're aware of why you're doing what you're doing, what you're listening to at that time. If you remember, there are three lobes on the right, two lobes on the left. So when you listen to the right, the left, you see down left lower lobe, right lower lobe, why you have to go off to the sides, which I'll show you. And then the majority of what you're hearing in the back is your right and left lower lobes. Your chest, you have, again, your sternum, 12 pairs of ribs. There's 12 thoracic vertebrae that make up your thoracic cage. You have your diaphragm, which is that flat pancake muscle here that separates the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity. And your ribs 11 and 12. Are called your floating ribs. They do not attach to the coastal in here. Um, let's, let's keep moving here. So your pleural cavity, uh, your, some terminology here. I have all your terms on your last slide, but a lot of that terminology I will cover before I get to that slide. Um, ones I haven't covered through this lecture, I will tell you the definition at that time. So you have your bronchioles. You have your two bronchi, right and left, and they break off into the bronchial branches. And then your the bronchus go down to these smaller branches called your bronchioles. And then that goes down into these little tiny, I call the little grapes, called your alveoli. Those are the actual functional units of the lung, your alveoli. That's where your CO2 and O2 or your gas exchange actually takes place. Some other terms are bronchitis, which is inflammation of these bronchioles down here, or of your bronchi. And then you have cilia, which is the little hair-like cells that line the whole tracheobronchial tube. So when somebody has a terrible cough, a lot of times it's mucus, and the hairs are trying to push it up. Those pe people that choose to smoke, that tobacco, act that actually puts those cilia to sleep. So they later end up with that morning cough, because it's that cilia waking up trying to push that stuff out. Okay, so you begin with your inspection. You're doing anterior, lateral, and thoracic inspection of the thorax. You, you usually attempt to do this, even though this per picture of the person standing, do it with the person sitting. You're observing their respiratory rate, rhythm, depth, the symmetry of the chest. You're looking at muscle movement. You're looking at the ratio of your 
anterior versus your lateral, it should be a one to two. It's like this should be double when you look across or across this way. Your AP ratio. Costal angle, we're going to talk a little more of that's up in here. The next picture will explain a little better what this costal angle should be. It should be less than 90 degrees. You're looking at their spine because the spine deformities will impact your um, chest expansion. Also looking at your any deformities in the sternum. I put this cramp here. I found this mnemonic, C-R-A-M-P, for your inspection. C is for your chest wall symmetry or asymmetry, that the wall is expanding symmetrically, evenly. R is your respiratory rate and pattern. A is looking for accessory muscle use, which I will talk about more in a couple of slides. M is looking for any masses or scars on your skin. P is looking for paradoxical movement or moving the opposite of what you expect. So for inspiration, you expect this to go in, I mean, out and inspiration, you expect it to deflate. Some terminology to add here is when you're looking at your breathing rate, your tachypnea is a rapid, shallow breathing greater than 24 breaths per minute. And bradypnea is a slow respiratory rate of less than 10 breaths per minute. Dyspnea is a difficulty or labored breathing. Apnea is absence of breathing. So this is the one I mentioned when you're looking at your um, costal angle. This was just an interesting picture where this angle coming down and you have your little angle of Louis that you can palpate here and this should be less than 90 degrees if you were to look here I guess that's probably about a 45 degree angle it should be less than 90 it'd be increased with a barrel chest um, the next slide will show you images of a barrel chest barrel chest is often found with sometimes it happens with with osteoporosis or osteo, osteoarthritis and the bones joint space is not being very mobile but another place you will see it was with the um, emphysema patient that ends up with a chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or COPD because the air is is trapped the alveolar walls are destroyed and they get enlarged and the air gets trapped in the little alveoli. And as I said, COPD is a chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. There's two types, emphysema or chronic bronchitis. The old saying with emphysema, emphysema is the um, pink puffer and chronic bronchitis is blue bloater, which will come later in some of your med surge classes. Okay, so here's an image of the barrel chest. I thought this was just good to see the rounding. And it's it, sometimes you'll see very, very skinny person and the ribs sticking out with that barrel chest. But if we were to come down and do an angle, it's probably at least 90 degrees there. But the chest is going out instead of coming down this way. It's going out. Here's some other pictures to help you think about it. Here, when I talked about scoliosis, so that curvature of the spine, you can see where your lungs will be compressed on different sides, uh, causing some diff could cause some difficulties. Here's some other chest deformities. This is a pectus excavatum, P-E-C-T-U-S, excavatum, E-X-C-A-V-A-T-U-M. It's sunken in, evacuated. This is a pectus carinatum, C-A-R-I-N-A-T-U-M, where it's going out. They only they will do surgery. It's more cosmetic, unless 
significant and it's causing some issues um, in the anatomy. Let's talk a little bit about muscles. When I talk about using accessory muscles, I found this. I thought this was a great picture. These are the muscles you should use in normal breathing. A little bit of abdominal muscles. Um, your diaphragm. And the intercostal muscles in here. You should not. The abdominal muscles really help a little bit, but they should not be used a lot. Your accessory muscles, you will see a lot of like belly breathing, and you'll see the muscles get tense tight up here in your sternocleidomastoid, and you'll see like the scapula in the back moving and all. Um, so those are using your accessory muscles. They're breathing with a lot of effort. So we finished inspection and now we're to palpation. Your palpation progresses down, starts with the trachea. You're just feeling around for the midline of the trachea and any masses. Then you're going down to the chest, checking for, is that the, yes. Okay, for tenderness, masses, and crepitus. Crepitus is, like we felt the crepitus in the knee and the muscle and the joint. It's a grating or crackling or possibly a popping sound. Usually if you hear, feel crepitus up in the chest, it's from an emphysema or air that gets trapped in the subcutaneous tissue. You're looking for scars, feeling for masses, and any tenderness with any of the palpation techniques that you're going to use. You're gonna do chest for for chest excursion. Some places will tell you to do it in anterior and posterior. I'm just looking for you to do it posterior. As you can see there, you will put your hands on there. You have them take a deep breath. Your thumbs should come apart. And as they blow out or ex expiration, your thumbs should come back together. You will palpate on the anterior, on the chest wall, down, down to your xiphoid process. Continue with palpation. <coughs> You're going to do, um, I don't have a picture of you doing the front. You palpate in the front. And in the back, it's a palpating for any masses. As you can see here, just using not your fingers, but just the, the palm, the palm of the hand. And then using, I like to do the tactile fremitus with my hands at an angle like this. Instead of this, you have the option between the two. Tactile fremitus is a palpable vibration. It's sounds that are generated from your larynx and come through the bronchi and the chest wall. So you will put your hands, as I said, I do it this way. And I have them say 99. You can feel the vibration in your hands. You will do as, as it's marked here, the same places you listen to the lungs is the same pace places where you palpate. Um, so you will do, um, you can do the front or the back. I'm asking for you to do it in the posterior. That's what I will assess you on. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That way you're getting all the lobes. And you're also, um, as you can see, it's good to go in a pattern so that you do symmetrical left to right. Some people go here, 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 here. It's easier to just do that zigzag pattern so you don't miss any place. You're also palpating the chest wall in the front and in the back very gently. You're checking skin temperature. You're feeling for vibration or masses. You're also um, assessing for any tenderness. 
feeling for superficial lumps, lesions, inspecting the skin. Now we go to percussion. <coughs> percussion, we will be practicing in the lab. You will tap, so you see I do that. I use my index finger and I tap with the other finger on there and you progress down and around with that. You're going just down the major, the lung fields. You want to go down from the top and you want to get your bases also and go from side to side, comparing as you go. The sounds you hear in the adult should be long, loud, low pitched, and hollow. So you'll document if it's resident, hyper resident, um, dull, blunted. But you, what you expect is a long, loud, low pitched, and hollow. And hopefully that'll make sense from you doing this in the lab. Okay, so auscultation. I said you will percuss and palpate, palpate, then percuss, then auscultate in the same regions in the front and the back. I like this picture because it shows you in the front the lung fields you are listening to. So you need to get, especially over here, to get that right lower lobe. You instruct the patient to take a nice deep breath in through their mouth and blow it out gradually. You will listen with the flat part of your stethoscope or your diaphragm. Hold it firmly on their chest wall and listen for the full inspiration and expiration before you move your stethoscope. Go again from side to side and one, two, three, four, five, six. I, I don't go six, seven like them. I go straight across and then down. But either way, it doesn't matter. It's just that you're going back and forth and around. Do not confuse back, background sounds. You want to put your stethoscope directly on the chest wall. Otherwise, clothing and things will make noises. Um, if their shirt is on top of your stethoscope, that can cause noises. You want, I tend to close my eyes and just listen. What am I hearing? What do I expect to be hearing? Does this sound the same? Think your way through it. That's your anterior. And you go to your posterior, auscultating again, want the zigzag, getting through all the way side to side. So as you can see here, you're going to listen in seven places on the front, anterior, and ten places posterior. Starting supraclavicular and working your way down side to side. Again, have them breathe in their mouth. Nice and deep, blow out, listen for the whole inspiration and expiration. On the female, you will do your best to displace in the anterior, the breast, because you cannot hear the lung sounds through the breast tissue. Some names for breath sounds, bronchial vesicular. That's a normal breath sounds that you hear over the major bronchi should be equal in duration of inspiration and expiration. Vesicular, that's the normal breath sounds heard over the peripheral outer aspect lung fields. Crackles, or maybe heard as rails, there's fine crackles, of course crackles. You don't really hear the word rails anymore, you hear the word crackles, fine crackles, Course crackles, you hear these on inspiration. It's a small clicking, bubbling, or rattling sound you hear in the lungs. That is an abnormal sound. Bronchovesicular and vesicular are the normal sounds. Crackles, friction rub, bronchi, and wheeze are all abnormal sounds. So your friction rub is a coarse grating sound when the pleura are inflamed. Um, almost sounds like leather rubbing on leather, dry leather. Bronchi uh, is, is sort of like a snoring sound. It's low pitched. It occurs when 
air is blocked or 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 is having a rough time going through the large airways a lot of times the bronchi is due to secretions thick secretions in the air trying to go through this partially obstructed area your wheeze is a high-pitched musical squeaking sound that comes from narrow airways now remember your crackles fine or coarse is on inspiration So when you're getting your subjective data, asking about cough, do you have a cough? When did it start? Did it come on gradually? Did it happen suddenly? How long have you had it? How often do you cough? Does it happen certain times of the day when you get up, when you lay down, after eating, during the eating, when you're walking? Does anything come up? What does the color of the sputum? How much is it? Are you coughing up any blood? Does it look like it streaks of blood, frank blood in it? Would you describe the cough as hacking, dry, barking, hoarse, congested, bubbling? Multiple questions go with that cough. Shortness of breath. Uh, is that with activity? Is it at rest? How long does it last? Is it when you're sleeping? So we'll go over some terminology that has to do with, with uh, positional shortness of breath or time of day chest pain when you breathe does it hurt where does it hurt is it sharp dull aching kind of pain do you have any history of respiratory infections like if you had tb um, pneumonia chronic bronchitis lung disease such as chronic chronic bronchitis copd emphysema asthma the history of lung cancer do you smoke have you ever smoked is it tobacco, other things, any other inhalations, cigars, and how many packs per day or cigars per day for how many years? How long ago did they quit? Environmental exposure. Have they had any exposure, work environment anywhere else? Have they been, have they been exposed to DB? Self-care behaviors. When was their last TB skin test? Have they ever had one? Has it ever been positive? When is the last time they had a chest x-ray? Um, have they gotten their pneumonia vaccine? Have they gotten their influenza vaccine? Questions like that. So lots and lots of terminology. Many of these terms were covered. Um, I covered alveoli, angolului, apnea. Asthma is an abnormal respiratory condition with bronchospasms, wheezing, and dyspnea. Because the... the Airway is narrow, that's why you wheeze. Atelectasis is a respiratory condition that's due to a collapse or deflated section of the alveoli. Consolidation is solidification of portions of lung tissue due to filling with infections. A lot of times, like your post-op patient will have some atelectasis because the they're not taking the really deep breaths, so they're little alveoli or little grapes at the end are starting to collapse. They don't force them open, expand. Sometimes that collapse starts to fill up with, with mucus and it can become infected and lead to a pneumonia. Uh, redipnea, I told you, the low, shallow respirations under 10, bronchioles, bronchofasciculars, did COPD, did cilia. I just did consolidation, we did crackles, crepitus, dyspneas. I don't know if I did dyspnea, that's difficulty breathing. Emphysema, I covered, frematis, we talked about that vibration, friction rub, I talked about, hypercapnia, decreased level of oxygen in the blood, hypercapnia. Hyperventilation is an increased rate and depth of respirations. Hypoxemia. I just realized when I said hypoxemia, hypercapnia is an increased level of CO2 in the blood. Hypoxemia is a decreased level of 
oxygen in the blood. So here, hyper cap, so that's increased carbon dioxide or CO2. Hypo, low, low oxygen level in the blood. So sorry, I just realized when I said that. Okay, intercostal space, we have covered, that's the space between your ribs, we've covered that previously. Cosmal respirations are a type of hyperventilation that occurs in diabetic ketoacidosis or DKA, which is something that you will cover in med surge at a later date. Realize when I was saying the cosmal respirations, I did not put chain stokes respirations on here. That chain stokes is two words, it's a name C H E Y N E hyphen S T O K E S, chain stokes respirations. That's breaths that gradually become faster and deeper than normal, then slower and alternate with periods of apnea or no breath. That's really the dying respirations where they're, they're, um, fast and deep, and then they get slow and shallow, and then they have nothing. Chain stoking is what you'll hear people refer to it as. Um, orthopnea, only able to breathe in upright positions. So that's part of when you're doing your history. I will ask people, are you able to lay flat in the bed? Or I might say, how many pillows do you sleep on at night? Because a lot of times they don't think about it, until I ask, and then I'll find out they're sleeping on two, three, four, or they're sleeping in a recliner. And sometimes that's a question I ask, do you sleep in the bed or in a chair? Because if I ask about pillows, and they're not using pillows because they were in the recliner, but they do have orthopnea because they cannot lay flat and breathe. Paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. I've seen that abbreviated as PND. Capital P, capital N, capital D, paroxysmal, nocturnal dyspnea. Paroxysmal means it comes and goes. Nocturnal is at night. Dyspnea is difficulty breathing. So paroxysmal, nocturnal dyspnea is a sudden awakening from sleep, very short of breath. Percussion, we covered percussing the chest. Pleura, in case you need to know, it's a serous membrane which folds back onto itself and forms two-layered membranous pleural sac. Your pleural effusion is an abnormal fluid between those two layers of the pleura. That's what will cause your friction rub. And uh, we covered ronchi, tachypnea, vesicular sounds, vital capacity, it's the amount of air following maximal inspiration that can be exhaled. So you have them take a deep breath. That's when they do um, pulmonary function tests. They'll breathe in as much as they can. They blow it out hard and they get the capacity, the vital capacity of their lungs. In, uh, we talked about wheezing and you should know your xiphoid process that comes at the end of your sternum. And that is the end of this lecture. Thank you.